Welcome to my woodworking shop studio and school in Santa Rosa, Northern California. This is a table that I designed and built back in 1991. I call it my ancient Egyptian inspired table. One of my inspirations was using this incredibly figured rare mahogany known as quilted mahogany. This wood has an amazing three-dimensional grain pattern, sometimes referred to as reptilian figure. I'll tell you the story about this tree later. The ancient Egyptian influence motivated me to include genuine gold leaf on the rings and crossbars, lapis lazuli on the ends of the bars, hand-carved feathers, and eyes on the duck heads inlaid with ebony and ivory. First, I'll show you how I created the curved legs for the table. This is one of my old storage buildings here, and I still have the original form that I built way back in the early 80s when I started working on this table. Let's take a look at it. I'll bring it inside the shop so we can take a closer look. So for my original design for this table, what I wanted to do was to get away from the typical four-legged table and come up with something more contemporary and unique. And so what I've decided to do was uh, to attempt to make a frame that would extend from the top and curve 180 degrees and come all the way down into the base of the table. In order to do that, I had to come up with a way to bend this wood. Now, kiln-dried wood doesn't steam bend very easily. And what I prefer to use is a technique called bent wood lamination. Now, fortunately, a good friend of mine, Michael Cooper, lives about 15 minutes away from here in Sebastopol. And back in the early 80s, he gave me some lessons on how to do bent wood lamination. So this is the original form that I used. And what Michael had suggested was making this form out of some, some uh, good strong plywood and then attaching bolts to it and then having a series of these, these wooden clamps that would basically swivel and come over to the other side and hook up with this bolt on the other side so that I could uh, take a, a drill with a socket driver and tighten these down and have a quick method of clamping this all the way around this curvature on the form. The bend wood lamination process starts out by taking a solid piece of wood and then cutting it into a series of thin strips, which makes it very flexible, and then taking all these layers, coating them with glue, and then bending this to create the curve that we're looking for. Now, this is relatively uh, what I would call more of a modern technique because back in the old days, for thousands of years, the only glue that woodworkers really had access to was hide glue. And hide glue is a great glue, but I don't think it would give you enough working time to do this type of technique. So the glue that I prefer to use is a urea resin glue. And here's one of the brands that I use here. This is a Unibond 800. It's a, a liquid catalyst or a liquid resin that you mix with a powdered catalyst. So once I mix those up, I'll take a, a glue roller, and this is one of those speedball rubber rollers, and I'll take this and use that to rub the glue onto the wood. And after I've coated both sides of the, uh, the laminates, I put these into the bending form and clamp that down and just let it sit until the glue dries. For doing a difficult bend like this, I decided it would be better off if I did some test bends. Now this wood here is Philippine mahogany, which I wouldn't really consider to be a, a good quality furniture grade wood, um, as opposed to Honduras mahogany. Honduras mahogany is a very good quality wood and a good furniture grade wood. Now when you're bending wood, there is this strange little thing called spring back. So you can bend a piece of wood the wood has a memory, so it wants to straighten out again. Now, the interesting thing is in doing a 180 degree bend, which you, uh, this was the first time I had done it, I encountered something else called spring forward. So rather than wanting to spring back and straighten out, once you get past 180 degrees, it wants to keep on going and starting to spring in. So this, this, uh, this was good to get that knowledge ahead of time. 
and then I modified my design by making a cut here and joining on the carved pieces and then eventually adding a cross bracing here to stabilize the piece. So one of the challenges of furniture is doing the joinery and doing the shaping. Now when you take it into the field of doing curved work, it gets a hell of a lot more complicated. Let's take a look at this. So if you're taking this piece here and you need to take a flat top and join it into those sides, you want to cut that joinery first before you start doing the carving and the shaping. Now fortunately the joinery on this was pretty straightforward. I just took a slot cutter and that way the slot cutter, the bearing, could uh, rest up against the stock and then the cutters are going to spin and rotate and cut a slot into the stock. I can adjust the height of this back and forth and create a spline that's say a quarter of an inch wide or maybe it was three eighths of an inch wide. And by the way, uh, plywood works very well for a spline to attach pieces of furniture together. And once the joinery was cut, then the next thing I wanted to do was to take this shape and round all those corners and get this sculpted shape that you see here. So the quickest way to do that was just with a very large roundover bit. So I used a large radius bit to step it around all four sides and use that to do the rough shaping. And then I came back and finished it off with some handwork. So I like using the pattern maker's rasp. This is one of the old Nicholson's number 49 pattern maker's rasp. Excellent tool for doing hand, hand shaping. And the tooth pattern is staggered so that it's all not in a row like a file. It's got a, a staggered pattern, which just allows it to cut a lot more uniformly. So I went from the 49 uh, to the number 50, which is a smoother pattern maker's rasp. And again, just a very controlled shaping action. And um, this is a really good one. This is by REU, but I don't think I had one of these back in the 80s. But this is one of the tools that I use nowadays. And then another one that I did have back then was a curved rasp. <clears throat> Excuse me, a curved rasp. So I could use this for that curved shape. So that curved profile would help to do the rough shaping, then come back with a fine tooth pattern and use that for the fine shaping. In 1979, the Tutankhamun exhibit was on display at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. It's safe to say that this exhibit set off a worldwide sensation. There was something about the incredible beauty of the objects and the sense of mystery that surrounded these objects. There was also this sense that the ancient Egyptians knew a heck of a lot more about the afterlife than anybody else that had come before them. Now, I had gone down there in 1979 to San Francisco and saw this exhibit and I was completely captured by it. It's uh, influenced my furniture ever since, and uh, all the gold and the inlay and the proportions and the designs are just beyond astounding. Uh, another piece that I was really captured by was this necklace here with the lapis lazuli and all these other stones and, and the scarab beetles, which is a, uh, a symbol of regeneration in the Egyptian in you know, the Egyptian uh, mythology. Now, a lot of people have asked me what my um, inspiration was for my ancient Egyptian table, and it was specifically this piece here. Um, not so much that it was a remarkable piece, but there was something about these surrealistic duck heads or these imaginary figures clutching this stick in their mouth that captured my mind and got me thinking about ways to incorporate that into the design of a table. So what I did was I, I sort of took this as a starting point and then build, uh, build upon this and started to work out designs for a carved duck head that I could incorporate into the table. My other inspiration for this table came from this unbelievable wood known as quilted mahogany and also it's became nicknamed as the tree. Now the story of this stuff is just incredible. In 1965, there was a group of loggers that went into the Honduras jungles of Chickabool and they discovered this tree that was 100 feet tall, 50 feet to the first branch, and 10 feet in diameter. The bark was spiraled and twisted, which indicates a really highly figured uh, grain pattern inside, in this case, uh, a quilted pattern, which is extremely rare in mahogany. So 
they went in there, they found this tree, they cut it down. Fate being what it is, it didn't fall where they intended it to fall. It kind of twisted and buckled and rolled and landed down inside this ravine. It got wedged in between these cliffs and they couldn't get it out. They tried to pull it out with a couple of D7 caterpillars and it was no good. They gave up on it and then 20 years later, this guy named Robert Novak put together a team of cutters and so they went back into the jungles in 1985 and this time they went down into this ravine and they cut it up into eight sections. Then they dragged all eight sections up out of the ravine. Then they had to drag this thing through the jungle for 70 miles. Can you imagine that, dragging this thing through the jungle for 70 miles? They got it to the river and then they had to float it down the river for another 100 miles. I mean, it's just incredible what they went through to get this wood. At that point, uh, some of it got sawn up and it eventually got shipped into Florida. From Florida, the rest of it got shipped to Tim Mahoney, who owned a company called Hand Loggers in Sausalito. Now that's where I first saw it, and it just blew me away. I saw a sample of this wood with this three-dimensional grain pattern and what's become known as this uh, reptilian sort of figure. And I just thought, I gotta have some of this wood. Plus, I decided then and there that this was going to become the wood that I used on the top of my Egyptian table. So I still have some of this wood. I'll show it to you and you'll be completely amazed at the three-dimensional figure uh, in this quilted mahogany known as the tree. This is one of my prized pieces of quilted mahogany. The grain in this is just phenomenal. It's a little over 11 and a half inches wide, a full one inch thick, and almost eight feet tall. Let's take a look at this with some solvent on the top of it. I decided to bring this inside so you could see the wood better in the light. It was getting kind of dark outside. You can really see how the solvent wets the grain and that three-dimensional figure just starts to come to life. This will give you an idea of what it would look like with some oil on there or with some varnish on there. This figure has become known as a reptilian figure because it highly resembles the, uh, the figure that you see on some type of a reptile. Pretty amazing stuff. You can really see that three-dimensional figure in the wood. A tremendous amount of depth and, and uh, figure to it. challenging to make the transition from this type of imagery into the final piece here. One of the things that I did was I sent away for a casting of a duck's head. That gave me some idea of the actual scale and proportion of a genuine duck. From there, I took the casting and then started to enlarge it to a, uh, a larger size. This is more about the scale of what I was looking for, but it still needed some refinement. Now, one of the big parts for me was trying to figure out what to do with the eyes. <laughs> the eyes were extremely difficult and they had to be dead on right because if they aren't right, then the whole piece fails. So the project actually came to a halt for a year until I finally decided that the best choice was gonna be a classic combination of ebony and ivory. So what I used was some, some uh, Gabon ebony for the eyes to get that jet black color and then some uh, fossilized walrus tusk ivory to get the, uh, the outer white section of the eyeball. Now, when you're dealing with ivory, there's two types of dentin. There's the primary dentin, which is on the outside, and the secondary dentin, which is on the inside. 
And for this one, I really wanted to have that, that white uh, color, so I went for the primary dentin, which meant, you know, taking a slice off on the bandsaw and then just uh, capturing that outer white area and then inlaying the ivory into that. Now, carving is a time-consuming process. I did have access to a duplicarver back then, and so I was able to rough out eight blanks. And I also had an apprentice working for me, a couple of apprentices working for me back in the 80s. This was written up in Fine Woodworking Design Book 6. This came out in 1992. But they did an article on me back then and a couple of apprentices that I had. And there was this gal named Gwen Rosewater, who's a very, very good carver. So I assigned her the task of doing all the final detail work of finishing up the feathers with a nice, real fine uh, V gouge. Because the, um, you know, once, once I had designed and carved the initial shape and then roughed it out with the dupla carvers, it, it's close within about an eighth of an inch or maybe about a sixteenth of an inch. But that last little bit of detail all has to be done by hand, carving all these laborious rows of feathers. And she did an outstanding job. I've just completed a restoration of the table. I used genuine 23 and 3 quarter carat gold leaf on the rings and crossbars. I've meticulously wrapped the table like an Egyptian mummy. Now it sits entombed in a four inch thick layer of foam encased in a heavy duty crate that I made specifically for the table to be shipped to a prominent collector on the East Coast.